He's so proud to call you his child. He's so proud to call you his child. I mean, look what he made, and he loves you the most. That's crazy. Okay. Good to start. <laughs> okay. So I was I was down on the rocks earlier, and. And I was just talking to God. And I thought about triumph and praise. And then I was like, what does that mean? So I looked it up. <laughs> In the dictionary. <laughs> so triumphant is an adjective that means having won a battle or contest, so victorious, or it's a feeling or expression of jubilation after having won a victory or mastered a difficulty. And praise, to express warm approval or admiration of As a noun, it means the expression of or the expression of approval or admiration for someone or something. So I've been reading this book called The One Thing by a guy, one of the authors is Gary Keller of Keller Williams Real Estate, which is the biggest real estate company ever. Um, and he's a Christian, and the book's not really Christian based, but he talks about, um, it's basically about productivity, really, at its core. Like one of the things that he talks about is multitasking is a lie. Yeah. Like mu the, the, the idea of multitasking in our culture is like, it, it's in job descriptions and you put it on your resume as like a bonus. You're able to multitask, you know what I mean? Um, but the best example that he uses in that book that I remember um, is he, he talks about, like we can walk down the street and have a conversation with somebody. Pretty easy, you know, you don't really have to think about it. So, but if you get a phone call and the person on the other end of the phone wants you to talk them through how to land the 747 that they're flying, you'll stop walking. <laughs> because some of your concentration when you're walking, gets taken just by the act of walking. It's an unconscious act, but your brain power is used. So anyways, he, the, the, the chapter that I read on my way here, um, He was talking about, so the book is called The One Thing, and the one thing is you ask yourself a question, and he breaks it down into certain areas of your life, but the question is, what is the one thing that I can do right now that will make everything else either easier or unnecessary? So the chapter that I read on the way here, he was talking about um, breaking that down 
like you have a goal in your life and then five years and then a year and then a month and then a week and then a day and then right now. And he said, most people are very good at envisioning what they want to do with their life. But he quoted some study that said, if you are able to envision your goal and then how to get there, you're like 40% more likely to make it. Like I was taught growing up that having goals is a good thing. <clears throat> but I don't know how to make a path to get there. And I was never much of a planner. <laughs> the first time I came to this camp, it was the first one they did. And there were, what, 15 people, 16 people? And Alyssa sent, like, Alyssa and I knew each other when we were kids and then got reconnected years later after not seeing each other for a long time. So I didn't really know Alyssa that well. And I remember her sending me the schedule for this camp. And it was like teaching after teaching after teaching after teaching, like half hour slots. And my immediate reaction to that is like, oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to suck. Because, because I grew up re rebelling against any authority. Uh, any schedule, anything that told me, that tried to like confine me. I've heard, um, I've really appreciated hearing everybody speaking so far this weekend. And there's been some things that I agree with, and there's been some things that I don't. And I learned a long time ago, not a long time ago, like in the big scheme of things very recently, like within the last four years, five years, that when somebody says something, especially when they're talking about spiritual things, and my immediate reaction is to put my chest out and sit up straighter, that's my offense to what they're saying, and I push into it. Because if I believe that I know how to define the God that created everything that I understand and everything that I don't, I am sorely mistaken. And I don't want to be limited. And I certainly don't want to limit a limitless God. So that first year, that first camp that I came here, it changed my life. And it had a schedule. <laughs> and we followed it pretty good. And that was one of those moments that I realized, like, because I've always been, like, I don't have notes. I remember teaching one time and somebody coming up to me and being like, can I get your notes? And I, I opened up the notebook that I had and it was like 16 different words just written in various sizes. I was like, not really. <laughs> because, because I, when I try and do a teaching the way that I was taught to do a teaching where you have like you find what you want to talk about and then you have your points that you want to make and you put them all down. For me, it, it cripples me to try and do things that way. But I realized 
that camp was one time, that first one of these camps was that one of those times where I realized that the hearts of Justin and Alyssa in creating that schedule, they were walking with God the way that I expect to walk with God when I'm here speaking. And who am I to say, I'm not going to follow your schedule because it doesn't fit what I think is right. Like at what point am I going to believe that God is able to work in others as well as He can work in me? And at what point am I going to trust that other people are able to do things that I don't like to do really well? I want to read... um, Out of Romans, this is the Passion Translation. Um, A lot of you guys knew my stepdad. You knew John, and (laughs) he died last summer. (laughs) <laughs> and my mom likes to say it like it was really hard for us but it was normal John like I'm out <laughs> it's perfect for him you know no pain no nothing just tsk, see ya <laughs> but he lived and breathed Romans Like, I remember him talking about he spent a year in this book until he really believed it. And you saw it if you got to know him. I'm going to stand still for a minute, everybody. Give you a break. (laughs) So Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let the inner movement of your heart always be to love one another and never play the role of an actor wearing a mask. Despise evil and embrace everything that is good and virtuous. Be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion towards Him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let Him fill you with excitement as you serve Him. Let this hope burst forth within you, releasing a continual joy. Don't give up in a time of trouble, but commune with God at all times. That last part, commune with God at all times. I need practice with that. I'm getting better. I remember talking to my mom a few months after John died. And I was just like, Ma, how's your heart, you know? How you doing? And she said, this is the most beautiful time with Jesus I have ever had. Because when I think about John, and when I start to miss him, I stop. And I close my eyes. And I say, Jesus, you're here. do that yet (laughs) but I want to (coughs) okay (coughs) 
So I really started to learn um, how to support differences in people living with Brendan. <laughs> because like those of you who heard him preaching the other night, like first of all, that was the most free I have ever heard you. Like, dude, it was fire, it was fire. And it was the, like from a place of freedom that I've never seen in him before. I've known you, what, like five years probably at this point? So I'm not Brendan. <laughs> like, Brendan has that, like, that was like, you saw it the other night, it was like a freaking meteor. Like, just fire coming down. That's Brendan. But I'm more like... I'm more like the pilot light on a boiler. If you've ever seen that, it's a, it's a, it's a little flame, but it doesn't flicker. And it's there that when you need it, it ignites. We both have a very, very important purpose. And I do not want to be him. <laughs> I'd be super bad at it. <laughs> and I don't want him to try and be me. Because he'd be bad at it. <laughs> you know, John, John was up here talking. And I was here in his heart. I've never met John before. And he was talking about like the past that he came from. And he doesn't, he doesn't go there. He doesn't talk about it much. And I think that that is a beautiful thing. But for me, I had to learn how to go there. Because I grew up, I grew up a Christian. I grew up knowing... Like, we know the truth, so you got the truth, so you got the truth, you're born again, you speak in tongues, you're a new creation. See, it says it. <laughs> but I put on a mask because I lived addicted. I lived addicted to pornography. I lived addicted to cigarettes, alcohol, anything I could, I could get to make me forget that I hated myself. So I lived in darkness, but was told I was in light. I lived broken, but was told I was whole. And I had, a, I had a lot of people over the years that, that were able to say, like, no, 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 the old man is gone. Like, it's dead, it's gone. This is who you are now. And for them, that worked. But for me, it didn't. And I would try and do that and be that. And like, no, 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 like, that stuff is gone. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. It's behind me, it's dead, it's in the grave, it's on the cross. It's all paid for. My stepdad was really good at that. Brendan is very, very good at that. But I couldn't do that because I would get into situations and I would have a level 10 reaction to a level 5 situation. And there was no reason for it. And when I took the time 
to find, like my dad left when he, when I, before I turned two. And that, that wounded me. And it defined a lot of who I was as I got older. And when I took the time to recognize the scar, like I think John, when he was talking, talked about like having an open wound. If it stays open, it festers. Like for me, that was a festering wound. And it had infected my whole body. It had infected my person. And there, was, there wasn't anyone around me to teach me how to go. Like, you need to heal that wound. Like, you need to go and you need to heal that wound. And for me, that's what I needed. That's what I needed to come into the understanding of what it means to be a man. Because before I addressed that, responsibility I ran from. Because I didn't believe I was worthy of a father's love, I couldn't receive his love. I couldn't really understand it. So over time, I learned, I like, forgive my dad. Because I think my wife talked about it last night, like, if you, somebody, no, Alyssa talked about it, like, if you're not forgiving somebody, they aren't suffering you are not punishing the other person by holding a grudge. It sits in you and it festers and it becomes a root of bitterness. And that changes the lens that you see the world. And when you're filled with unforgiveness and bitterness, you get surrounded by people who are also filled with unforgiveness and bitterness. What you harbor in your heart will gladly be fanned into flame by things that are exactly the same. So when I chose to forgive my dad and find him, like, I still haven't seen my dad since I was five. But I talk to him on the phone every couple of months. I know where he lives. I'm glad that I don't have his life. But I'm also privileged to be one of the few people who still show that man love. He doesn't owe me anything. And when you can get in that place where you know your identity in the Father, like I dare, I dare any one of you to try and talk me out of who God has told me you are. I dare you. You cannot convince me. What a privilege it is to surround yourself with people 
who think differently than you and believe differently than you. Please challenge me. Please challenge me. Because one of two things will happen. Either you'll convince me that I'm wrong, and I have been often. I know you guys haven't, but I have. I have been wrong often. So either you will show me where I have seen something incorrectly, or you will convince me further and convict me further in the truth that I know. But I'm not afraid to be wrong. I'm privileged to be wrong. So I think, like, I don't know how much more I have left to say. But praise and worship is probably the most powerful weapon I have discovered in the last few years. Like, speaking in tongues, that's pretty baller. (laughs) Somebody talked about George Mueller and I think it was George Mueller that, was it George Mueller who said he would speak in tongues for himself two hours a day, every day? Oh, I was talking about the book. (laughs) Okay, okay. So, The last chapter that I read, he was talking about, you know, you have your life goal, five year, one year, month, week, day, right now. And I've been I've been seeking out alone time with God more and more and being consistent with that in my life. And I was reading that chapter and as because I like, I don't, I don't really care about being productive in the world, per se. Like, I know that I will be, and I'll be blessed with that. But I care about being productive in the Spirit. So, I was reading that chapter, and I was thinking about... Um, I was thinking about prayer. And about recognizing that God is here... Now, like, what, what are my goals spiritually and in ministry and what I've been called to by God for my life? And step down, step down, what can I be doing right now that will bring me there? And then everybody, it's like, the topic is triumphant praise, and like the first four teachings are about prayer. That's probably not a coincidence. <laughs> I saw an Albert Einstein quote yesterday that said, Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> So I've learned to pray and I've learned to praise and worship and I actually like like to sing and I like to put my hands in the air and I like to move and I like to envision myself in the throne room.
Like, God gave you an imagination for a reason. And I, I remember hearing a testimony of a guy who was a Satanist, and he got born again. But he was a Satanist that was like crazy. Like, he would go to hell and talk to the devil. You know, like in his, in the spiritual realm, like outside of this reality. He would step outside of this reality and go to hell and talk to the devil. Everything that the devil does is a twisted version of what God created. So why can't I... Why can't I go to heaven? I'm not saying let's all get in a circle and try to go to heaven. <laughs> but if, if that is a reality for someone who serves the kingdom of darkness, why can't it be a reality for someone who serves the kingdom of light? Why can't we go to heaven? Why can't we go to the throne room? Why can't we see angels? Why not? Because I remember growing up and thinking that stuff like that was wrong. And I don't know where it came from. And I don't care. But like I said, if my reaction to somebody talking about something is to pull back, I'm going to listen more. Because I don't want to stand still. As you can tell. <laughs> so like, I'm so glad that there are men like John. Like... I want to be as manly as you. I used to have a beard, but it didn't look as good as yours. <laughs> but really, like, I'm glad that there are men like John and how I'm glad there's cowboys. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad there's cowboys in this body. And I am glad that I'm not afraid to cry in front of all of you. And I'm glad that I'm not afraid to talk about my emotions. And I'm glad that you don't define my value. And I can be entirely me. Because if you don't like it, I mean, that's too bad for me, but it's really too bad for you. Because he thinks I'm precious. <laughs> so the things that you don't like about other people, maybe try and figure out how to understand it. Just, just, just love each other and honor each other. Like, what a privilege this is. Just learn, just learn how you're going to praise him. Because it doesn't, like, my wife, when she gets going, like, we, she, not too long ago, she's sitting next to me, she's like, babe, my neck hurts. And I said, well, stop whipping your head around when you're worshiping. Like, <laughs> it looks like it hurts. It's like, 
It's like shaking baby syndrome, you know? <laughs> but people like her used to freak me out. The way that she prays it, the people with the flags and the... That used to freak me out. <laughs> but, I, but I see it now, and when, I, when my mind is right and I'm focused on the things of the kingdom, I see that she is warring. She is battling for the kingdom of heaven. And that's a powerful thing. And you got like Justin, man, like God's heart walking around in a body. <laughs> For real. So the first time I met him, I'm listening to him talk. I was like, ah. <laughs> and, and you got Brendan, just like, <laughs> it's like you're listening to him and you're convicted and excited at the same time <laughs> so I'm supposed to be better I am better <laughs> you, got, you got Kevin it's like Kevin belongs on a microphone <laughs> I still get nervous as heck before I come and speak in front of people. I do. It's like how many times can I go pee in an hour? <laughs> Just in case. But there's nothing like there's nothing wrong with that, and I have I have learned to listen. I have learned to listen to the voice that tells me you don't have anything to say, and turn it around. Last thing, there's a, there's a guy named Graham Cook, English dude. He's awesome. He got a phone call one day and picks up the phone. Hello. He's English. Brendan does his accent way better than me, so I'm not going to try. But he picks up the phone. He says, hello. And the guy says, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so. I'm a Satanist. I'm just calling to put a curse on you. Oh. So, so Graham says, okay, give me a second. Let me get a pen. So he gets a pen. It's like, okay, go ahead. And the guy, you know, puts it, tells him what it is. So he's writing, he writes down the whole curse. And then he says, okay, uh, thank you very much. I, I just want, um, my Lord has a message for you. And the guy says, uh, okay. And Graham says, okay. So, you got a pen? <laughs> he says, so this is, uh, this is what Jesus has to say to you. I'm coming to get you. <laughs> so, he hangs up the phone. He takes the curse. He writes, he takes what was said in the curse, transfers it into a blessing. Binds the curse, burns it, speaks the blessing over his life. And then it's what, six months later? He gets a phone call. <laughs> Answers the phone. The guy says, hi, I'm so-and-so, do you remember me? He goes, oh, yeah, 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 you called to put a curse on me. How's it going? <laughs> and the guy says, after I talked to you and you told me what Jesus said, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. That I, no Christian has ever responded to me that way. 
said, and then I was in the, I went, I went to my convent, 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 whatever <laughs> witches and warlock thing he, his what? Like a covet. A covet, a covet. So their covet was out in the woods and they were going to do like a sacrifice and they had the fire and there was 27 of them, 20, something like that. There's 27 of them, so they're all around the fire in the woods and they're ready to do this sacrifice. And Jesus showed up in the fire. And they all froze. They couldn't move. And Jesus walks out of the fire and he walks around the circle and he touches them one by one on the forehead. And they all got delivered. And he didn't say a word. They all got delivered and born again. Because of Graham Cook confidence in who he is that when evil comes into the room or is spoken over him, Jesus is coming to get you. <laughs> so let's, let's us get to the place where we believe that. Let's us get to the place where we can praise and worship freely and we can understand who we are and we can support each other in who they are. Like, let's get there.